Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Uh, let me just organize my screen. <laughs> So on behalf of the department's uh, Division of Intellectual Disability and Social Responsiveness Committee, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to Dr. Valerie Sinison, who will be talking to us about working with trauma in a country in trauma and a time of COVID. March is the month that we commemorate Intellectual Disability Awareness Month, and we hold in mind that people with ID are at a far greater risk for trauma, abuse, and neglect, and this in a country plagued with violence, poverty, and inequality. COVID and its impacts have been far reaching for children, adolescents and adults with ID and their caregivers, and we're still dealing with the fallout even as we move towards living with it. So who better then than Dr. Sinison to help us reflect on this and the way forward, a pioneer in the field of ID psychotherapy. Dr. Sinison's work, is, in work with ID is seminal and no doubt has shaped many of our practices and understandings as we seek to improve the quality of life of those with ID who we work with in families, communities, schools, and hospital settings. Dr. Sinison is a poet, writer, retired child and adolescent psychoanalytic psychotherapist and adult psychoanalyst. She has specialized in trauma and disability for 40 years. She's a widely published writer and lectures nationally and internationally, and how lucky are we to have her uh, lecturing to us today. She's the founder and patron for the Clinic for Dissociative Studies in the UK and president of the Institute for Psychotherapy and Disability. Dr. Sinison is on the board of the International Society for the Study of, Tra of Trauma and has received the 2016 Lifetime Achievement Award and the British Psychoanalytic Council Innovation Excellence Award in 2022. She's an honorary consultant psychotherapist at the Cape Town Child Guidance Clinic and has been an almost yearly visitor to Cape Town for over 20 years. Her latest books are The Truth About Trauma and Dissociation, Everything You Didn't Want to Know and Were Afraid to Ask, we can always count on Valerie asking the uncomfortable truths, trauma and memory, the science and, and the silenced, and treating children with dissociative disorders. Her first novel, The Orpheus Project, will be published in April 2020 and promises to be a fascinating read for those who, who do read it. Dr. Sinison speaks with courage, clarity, and truth, sometimes hard and uncomfortable truths, but this, is, but this often leads to hope of what is possible in the work that we do. Some quick housekeeping rules. Please keep your videos off and your microphones on mute. Um, it helps with the bandwidth uh, in terms of the videos. If you have a question or a comment, there will be time for those um, in the last few minutes of the talk. You're welcome to, we can, you can ask your questions or comments verbally, or you can pose them in the chat box and we'll be monitoring that. You are welcome to make, yeah, like I said, make comments in the chat section. Please note that the talk will be recorded and made available on our departmental website and our socially responsive mental health YouTube channel. We will also take some screenshots for possible use in our newsletter and website. So if you do not consent to be used in those photos, please do keep your videos off. So with that, I hand you over to Dr. Sinison. Thank you, Tony. And what a privilege to be invited to join you because I've missed coming so much in 20 years of coming practically yearly uh, to, to Cape Town. Um, I've always made a visit to Lenta here and to UCT, and it is wonderful that cyberspace can bring us together. But my housekeeping point to add at the beginning, as well as freeze as a natural biological instinct to fear, we now have the fear of cyber freezing, suddenly being frozen out, losing our attachment. So I have my mobile with me, which is very trustworthy. And if anything goes wrong with the Zoom or I disappear, I will be ringing back on the mobile to get back in. Um, but for us to be aware in, in our work with clients, as well as our links with colleagues and friends, what new attachment worries uh, cyber links bring, as well as the joy of making connections that wouldn't otherwise happen. There's the fear of suddenly losing it, losing the person, we get a separation anxiety coming back of a kind we might not have experienced for ages. And there's also the unusualness of looking at a face intently. 
So to be aware for yourselves that it can be very tiring as well as relieving. And so it's good for people to develop an etiquette of saying, I, I prefer to not have my face seen so I can walk, look around. Because usually when we're talking to somebody face to face, our eyes can go anywhere, we blink naturally. But when we're on a Zoom, we are focusing intently and we need to be aware of, of the different kind of tiredness that causes. And of course, we have this overuse um, of our eyes precisely because of COVID. If we're lucky enough not to be in a country in war and we've all been glued to the painful news of what's happening in Ukraine to add to Afghanistan, Syria and all the tragedies going on everywhere. If we're lucky enough to not be facing that, we're still facing the strangeness of not being able to travel, of not being able to see people face to face and to be aware of what impact that actually has on us. I'm going to start with COVID because the, the plagues that humans get are so well documented and within the UK, if you read the works of Samuel Pepys, the diary of Samuel Pepys, or the writings of Daniel Defoe, uh, the journey, journal of a plague year, you will see that we're probably no different than our ancestors of several hundred years back. That uh, Samuel Pepys uh, wrote, Lord, how sad a sight it is to see the streets so empty of people. I did endeavour all I could to talk with as few as I could, there being now no clear observation of infected houses being shut up. So we do converse and meet with people that have the plague. There was an extra wariness coming into human contact where after the first stages of all plagues historically, houses marked themselves with daubings and you knew where an infected place was. As plagues went on and people got tired of it, they either stopped being forced to mark their homes or themselves. If they were lucky enough to not have a plague that produced terrible body markings and boils, uh, they stopped showing if they were infected and this led to a wariness in human relationships. How close could you get? Also a query about authority. Samuel Peake said, I'm going to allow myself alcohol in this plague time since my doctors died of it. His doctor had died of the plague. Therefore, since you could all die, all the people above you, all the people with power over you, all the people that understood you, then why should you listen to them? And some of those thoughts that came up a few hundred years ago are, are very useful for, for us to consider. We also have comments from Defoe and Pepys about young people, young people in great merriment, walking in crowds despite the risk and not caring whether they would pass on uh, the plague to their elders. So the different response at different ages to this plague matters as well. The wariness and isolation are of course where we're at one level lucky enough to be able to isolate 
people in crowded places can't make social distance. People in overcrowded places can't have a careful queue to try and find food, but are in more danger. And of course, as Tony said, it's no surprise to any of us that in any catastrophe of any kind around the world, it's our client group, those with intellectual disability, who are at the bottom of the hierarchy. And I'm ashamed to say that in the UK, we have had the shocking political results that half of all deaths of people with intellectual disability in the last few years have been from COVID. Half of all the deaths of that group. I've been in a research project that the Open University have been doing on young people with life limiting conditions. People that are on ventilators, are on dialysis machines. They may or may not have an intellectual disability too, but what they are facing and what we need to be reminding ourselves of is an external death wish coming towards them. This death wish also goes to the elderly and post-retirement at 75, I became more aware personally of what I knew academically, which is in recounting that the people most likely to die are the elderly and those with other conditions. I could almost feel, well, they're going to die anyway, so what does it matter if they die a year earlier? that they're old, they're going to die. And so in a way, the old, the disabled, those from cultures that aren't welcome, those who have been stigmatized in any way, those are the ones who are going to be the most vulnerable. And we then get to the point of realizing if it's our elderly, our grandparents, our aunts and uncles, if it's those with a disability in our families, physical or intellectual, we slowly realize the danger, the group in danger are us, us and us. As professionals, we have a kind of helpful dissociation of them and us. There's us, the helpers, and them, those in need. And that dissociation, so long as it's not too rigid, helps us manage the pain of what we see and our attempts to make a bridge but something different happens when the psychiatrist and the therapist sitting in the room with the patient are all vulnerable to COVID, can all die, as of course we all can with a bomb attack. We are all mortal and suddenly we are two mortals facing something together and that is a very different experience when our own professional dissociative barriers start falling down. Now before this leads to a kind of improvement for us in which we can feel compassion for ourselves and for our patients, it can hit us in a really painful way. How can we go and scrub our hands and put our, our medical garments on, our gloves, our sanitizers, sit face to face, do whatever we do without 
facing the terror. We could die and we could catch something from someone we're working with despite all the tests we're doing. And because we and you in particular compared to the UK are already dealing with the pain of social inequality, the level of poverty, hunger, violence going on, how are you to deal with that and hold that when your own life is in danger and the life of everybody in your family? How are the COVID babies born under isolation with no one adequately to support the parent or the parents? What's happened to them? What's happened to those too ill to work if their money was the only money that brought food to their, to their families? But what happens over the different attitudes of trauma we find ourselves starkly facing at such a time? Now, a lot of you will have heard of learners just world theory. This is the idea that, um, that the lucky have who can say, well, next year I'll go on holiday uh, to Europe if, if, if COVID's over and then the year after I want to do that. That's if you believe in a just world because you've internally had such an experience have been so lucky and privileged to assume that good things could go on. If you've got that attitude, when trauma comes, you're planning ahead for how to deal with what happens next. You can think about seeing through the end of it. In a way, this is like uh, Oscar Wilde's comic the good end happily, the bad unhappily, that's what fiction means. That if you believe in a just world and think things are going to end all right, you plan carefully for the future, you accept your jabs because unless there's strong reason against it, you know that this will improve your life uh, for, for the next period, but if you're not in that group, if you're traumatized, and many of my trauma patients, when I used to say, see you next week, they'd look at me as if I was mad and say, you can't say that. Why do you keep saying that? You can say, the Islamic, see you next week, inshallah, God willing, that has uncertainty in it. Or you can say, I hope to see you next week. But I had, I had the gift and curse of the lucky that I assumed next week all would be well. And it took a huge number of complaints from people I worked with to be able to stop me doing that. So if you come from a trauma background or you're living close to one and you've heard it and it's inside you in a profound way, you can't think ahead because you're more aware that you could be dead tonight, tomorrow. So if you have got that concept in you, how can you prepare for the next year? You much more have a live today, for tomorrow is uncertain. So the very people we most want to have protected in a time of COVID and in an unequal, unfair world they are the group 
but will be most unprotected internally and externally. The meaning of safety is totally different if you are in that group. So we face this, this reality of that difference far more profoundly in a time of COVID. Once a year, I used to go to Newcastle um, University uh, to give uh, talks on disability. And next to the psychology department, there was an ethology department. And I would look at the displays up on their wall. And the biggest displays by Dr. Tony Lazarus were about uh, South Africa. And it was, why do antelope feed in front of the lion, their main predator? That was their key research. And uh, I finally found um, a, a, a way of contacting Tony Lazarus and said, why, why do they feed in front of their predator? And he said, because it's the safest place. If you watch your predator, you can see when it's hungry, when it's rested, when it's full up. So the safest moment for an antelope is to see a lion that's had a good meal and is going to have a sleep. And I just found that so helpful and de-shaming to say to every abuse survivor I, I, I know and to ask everyone to pass this on because of course you're safest with the enemy you know. If you were to go round the corner on seeing lions, an antelope might find a ravenous pride of lions and be in more danger. So when we think about the groups that can't follow safety in a COVID time, or in a non-COVID time, we need to hold in mind with humility the different concepts of safety there are. So if somebody is going back to their abusive home, their abusive township, their abusive everything, it's no good saying I've been working hard trying to get you out of that. It's much more, of course, you feel safer there. You don't know what you'll find anywhere else. So how do we bridge the two different attitudes to trauma? And one is by accepting the truth that danger is in the world anywhere and everywhere and can spark up unexpectedly from the inside or the outside. And if we accept that, but that if we're lucky, we have ways of mediating it which help us more, maybe that will help us make a more humble bridge to those that are, that are suffering most. One uh, group, the, the art project in New Bethesda, uh, which set up uh, an art college for the township there and helped the San people there gain back their mythology, their history, uh, and has been able to help with food parcels right now during this period but through being valued and having a group bear witness to the genocide of their group and to bear witness to the richness of the mythology that was there there is a whole group 
but are now able by themselves to run their art school, their, their quilt making and everything else that's happened and now go back to help the townships they live in with, with food and concepts of safety. But they've had 20 years of a project aimed at de-shaming, restoring dignity and enhancing creativity. And in fact, one of the things that I've learnt most in talking about trauma and shame around the world is thanks to you, because it was coming to UCT and the Child Guidance Clinic especially um, learning how it was working to go and provide help in the most non-colonial way out. And it completely altered my therapy practice in the UK and has continued to um, for, for the last 20 years uh, since, since coming. And what amazed me from when I first started coming out was the way people uh, doing the, uh, their master's degrees at UCT um, and uh, going out to the Cape Town townships weren't coming from on high to give something to the deserving poor. It was coming in a spirit of this is all our shame that you are living like this. Is there anything that we can offer that might be of any use? It was so humble. And so I saw people then say, we're worried about AIDS. We're worried about rape. We're worried about violence. And slowly, bravely coming forward and getting the support to change something from within because the help that was being offered uh, was genuine and it was relational and it was understanding that there was a relational bridge needed given the hugeness of inequality and the awfulness of history. So please know that anything I'm saying to you all also comes with an awareness that you're my teachers and that you're living with a, a level of inequality that we have the shadows of, of course, in the UK, because it is always the poor, the immigrant, the LGBTQ, the minorities that are getting the worst of everything, but there is no comparison with the level of violence, poverty and, and inequality that, that you are facing and dealing so bravely with. But ironically, it's because of the shared trauma of a country that has gone through so much that is also bravely facing COVID that there is a chance for an even bigger rapprochement to be made because all vulnerable mortal humans are facing the same enemy which is our bodies are mortal and frail and we get things, we catch them, and that affects us. And that is something we can all share together. Sheila Hollins uh, and I uh, at St George's Hospital in London came up with a 10 minute assessment process um, for people with a disability, which of course, um, got attacked as being non-academic, um, not teaching anybody anything. But we were very 
proud of it and we added the academic things onto it but this was how an assessment would work uh, of somebody coming in uh, to, to see us um, and we would say hello um, I'm Sheila you can call me Sheila or Professor Hollins and I'm I'm Valerie, Valerie Sinison. You can call me Valerie or Dr. Sinison. How would you like us to address you? And often people with a disability were being brought in. Uh, John, age 60, brought in by Miss Smith, age 21. Um, there was a hierarchy in how names were used. So we would say this. And then, you're very brave to come to a meeting and see two people that you haven't met before. That must have been hard to come here. And we might get a smile then and someone feeling some smidgen of pride about it. And then one of us would ask, is there something special, some reason why you wanted to talk to somebody right now? And we'd often get, yes, my mum died. And whatever it was, it was the death of a parent was the most common, followed by abuse. Because in the UK, when someone with a disability loses a parent, they often lose their home as well. And there's no thought about that. They're just put into some sort of communal home and their violence is treated as bad behavior or violence, not that they've lost someone or missed someone. And then we would say, oh, that is very, very sad news. Do you think you'd like to come and talk to somebody about that here? It, it wouldn't be Sheila or me, but we'd find someone for you to talk to. Yes, right, you're on the waiting list. Because what we found was that people with a disability were being given pages and pages of questionnaires, all of which were important for understanding background but actually we could have a therapeutic relational assessment that made a difference. And in this time of COVID, there's been the extra tragedies of people with ID not being able to see a dying parent because of protection when they were in areas where there was protection or seeing a dying parent and catching COVID uh, from that last seeing or from the funeral. It's been terrible tragedies either way. And for parents, knowing their children are the most vulnerable. So facing this, facing these are the things that our clients face. We can help them by, by speaking honestly. Um, on the website, Books Beyond Words, um, Sheila Hollins, who is um, a Baroness in the House of Lords um, in, her, in her retirement, um, Books Beyond Words are a whole series of colour picture books which tell you about every key thing that matters, death in the family, abuse, um, washing, dressing, love, being hurt in love. For people with a disability and people with no uh, English language so that they can point and have a story that represents them. You can get a free download on COVID and how to explain to people with intellectual disabilities. And Sheila and I had just completed one on refugees when first we had, it, in the UK, the Afghanistan unending a procession of refugees 
and and now we have the tragedy of what's happening in Eastern Europe. Of course, you've been dealing with a level of people coming from Africa and some of the largest groups of human tragedies walking in your in into your area. But um, you can download those so there are pictures to share to speak. And what we are finding counts most is an awareness that this is all of us, that the more we can separate the dissociative them and us, the more we can offer, even if it's only one meeting we have to offer, we can make that one meeting an experience where someone feels their pain has been witnessed, where they feel they have been validated for some people having a witness to hear them is the most important thing we can do because what they've gone through is worse than anything we could imagine from our own families. Different bits of our own history come out at this time as both a gift and a curse. My grandparents came from the pogroms in the Ukraine to the UK. Uh, so one whole generation uh, came from Kiev and that's been bringing back curious double mixtures of impact of history and geography in that whilst one group came because they were the victim of pogroms at the hands of uh, East European Poles and Ukrainians, um, others were rescued by Russians at that point that allowed Jews to go to university and allowed minorities to be emancipated in the 1890s. And then you have other relatives that were victims of Russians. And of course, we have Russians that are facing their traumatic history, although a leader not facing it, he's got caught up in some terrible way. And I have one grandmother who became mildly learning disabled through trauma. And you have, of course, the wonderful Professor Leslie Swartz, who's written his own book on how his father's physical disability affected him in his work. So all of us are finding at a time of COVID and international trauma, things from our history that come to help us over how survival happened, over things that pain us and shame us and give us an understanding of what could be hurting the people we're working with now. One thing we have to rid ourselves of dissociatively is our wish to have the geography to be to blame. Oh, well, if you live in a country that has volcanoes, that has tsunamis, um, it can't be that you're going through pain because actually if you're living in a place that does things like that, well, then maybe your children don't get scared like mine would because this is your history. Or if you come from a country that commits genocide or that has civil war, well, that's what you're used to. Everybody tries to distance themselves from the pain of the other by wanting to find a reason why the other could manage it. The other isn't affected. The other is impervious to the unbearability of being a human that's frightened, that's tired, that doesn't know if their family will live or how they can support their family. So we are 
all having to reflect and come back to ourselves. What strengthens us? What helps us? Having a work group where you can have a minute to say, how are you? How are you really? What have you heard today that's knocked you out? Are your family okay? Your cousin in Afghanistan, your, your cousin in Syria, your cousin anywhere in Africa, how are your family? So that we can ground ourselves with everybody knowing none of us are supermen, superwomen. As professionals, we can have an idea that we are supermen and women and have this extra strength because we are not them, the other we look after who are weak. But the task now is to realize we get strength in accepting our weakness, what we can't do, what we can't put right, what's going to take generations, and to realize what a vulnerable species we are, that violence and sexuality, our two instincts, cause problems for every religion, every culture, every social class, all around the world, and there's no sign of that changing. We don't know what it would be like to live in a country of two generations where there's only been ordinary ups and downs of illness and injury, but not what comes from war, from scapegoating, stigmatizing, torturing, beating up the young, the frightened. So let's hold on to our common humanity of our frail species, because then we get our strength. One of the things I have uh, stuck to my desk is a sentence from the anthropologist Ashley Montague, where speaking of humans, he says, the first hundred thousand years, it would seem, are the hardest. We are a frail group. We are making terrible mistakes all the time. But there's also love, hope, collaboration, cooperation. And you, working in a zone of such pain, have been a light to other countries over the excellence you've put in place and what you are passing on not just to colleagues, but round the world. So let's have some comments, questions, and a thank you to you all for the circumstances in which you're working. Hi, Valerie.